Really big floods are of considerable interest to society. Big floods attract politicians. They are a place that will get considerable attention to scientific issues. But to communicate about this, we need to think carefully about fundamentals. At a meeting like this, we talk to ourselves, we talk to other scientists, but when we step out beyond that world, even when we step into a world with different kinds of scientists, there are problems of communication. The words we typically use don't get used in the same way. So, in the southwestern United States where I live, there has been a period of drought, long-time drought. The most populous, richest state in the country, California, was suffering from drought. So what happens? An extreme flood occurs. Everyone is shocked. Dams that had never been impacted before, like the Oroville Dam, were impacted by, as the title says, super floods. The southwestern U.S. is at risk from its water resources from drought. But if a big flood were to take out the Glen Canyon Dam, as it almost did in 1983, the infrastructure of water in the southwestern U.S. would be destroyed for decades. So floods are a big issue. It's important. It's important to get it right in terms of what's going on. So here are some words that we dandy about in regard to flooding, and it's these words are problematic when we try to communicate to engineers, to politicians, to others, because although they mean something special to us, they are interpreted at different ways by other groups. Even the term historical, uh, it is sometimes viewed as just stories, uh, sometimes just uh, documents of imperfect information. But historical events include flood marks, actual marks made on the heights of extreme floods. These are just like stream gauge records, and yet we call them proxies. We don't call an instrumental stream gauge record a set of proxies. It is a direct measure of floods. So the term proxy gets used a lot in pages because everybody's trying to relate their data set to climate. Most floods are caused by weather, okay? So we have to think very carefully about issues like the words we use. There are many different kinds of records of extreme floods, and I can't really give an overview of that in a short talk, but the point is there are many ways we can quantify records of floods of the past. Now, there have been recent spectacular global damage increases from extreme flooding that is unprecedented in stream gauge records. So this has led to concern by the hydrological community, the practitioners of what is commonly called flood hydrology. Those practitioners have two methodologies they work with. There is flood frequency analysis that is a completely unrealistic extrapolation from common floods to unknown extremes, applying statistical assumptions that are usually invalid to do so. And the second approach is a calibration of preconceived models to data on small frequent floods that are often unre causally unrelated to the extremes of greatest societal interest. So physics tells us that we can expect increases in extreme flood phenomenon because of the radiative forcing increasing and the latent heat increases. This will increase air temperatures and evaporation. We're gonna put more moisture into the atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a generality for the whole planet. Floods happen at specific places for specific reasons, meaning we have to know messy details. Physicists don't do that. They don't do messy details. Can we test the hypothesis that extreme floods are, uh, are changing? Well, we're spending most of our money at climate modeling. This can't test the hypothesis. 
We are decreasing the expenses that are put toward conventional stream gauges. And even though the conventional stream gauges are very good for water supply issues, the records are too short to indicate extreme flood phenomena. Minuscule expenses are put on historical and paleo flood studies. Those are the only things that could test this hypothesis. If you believe the philosophy of science, that is our purpose is to test hypotheses. So what are some misconceptions and myths that surround uh, the broader scientific understanding of extreme floods? So I work in a department of hydrology and atmospheric sciences. I've spent most of my career dealing with attitudes from people that don't understand the study of the past. So paleo flood and historical data are considered biased, inaccurate, subjective, lacking in rigor, and not truly scientific. And this is supported by a kind of physics-based philosophy of science, which, by the way, is being discredited among many current philosophers of science, though most scientists don't know that. And there's even an attitude that the future is going to be unlike the past, therefore the past is worthless in terms of this future that's going to be unlike any past that ever was, okay? I could go on and on about that one. Uh, to maximally benefit society, overwhelming scientific emphasis, funding, public promotion needs to be placed on predictive modeling and the associated reductions of uncertainty. Two loaded complex words, prediction and uncertainty. We hear them all the time. Just to give you an example, here is a recent paper about uh, climate modeling, credible projections, uh, reduced biases, account for variability, uh, decrease our uncertainty in regard to uh, current uh, uh, extreme events, reduce uncertainty, all of these are loaded. Flood science has advanced little in the last 50 years. And I say this as someone that has worked with flood scientists for a long time, because it really is a, a form of engineering that bypasses causal scientific understanding of the world. It's two methods, mathematical uh, methods, the, the mathematical modeling and lots of flood science generates uh, stochastic extreme weather flow weather events, uses uh, rainfall runoff models that generate the flood flows. Basically, that works with fake time scales. It's unreal. It's not real time. Past events are real time. And the, uh, the fake series is fed into rainfall runoff models. However, you can calculate the uncertainties really well because you have lots of data points. They have, they're fake data points, but you have lots of them. So you can calculate the uncertainties really well. Flood frequency analysis is not much better because it assumes statistical distributions and it violates basic statistical assumptions. So what are the problems you get into from an incomplete understanding of uncertainty? Well, here's a rather infamous American Secretary of Defense explaining uncertainty, and the result of his inadequate understanding of that is a $1 trillion mistake called the Iraq War. So in his explanation, he's talking about uncertainties. His unknown unknowns are aleatory uncertainty. This is the uncaused randomness that can be expressed as probabilities. But the worst kind of uncertainty is the one he was guilty of. It's epistemic uncertainty, where we know there are unknowns, but we don't study them because we're too lazy, it's politically not what we want to have, et cetera, et cetera. Epistemic uncertainty is almost never talked about because it's very difficult to quantify, but it's absolutely critical to the uncertainties that we deal with. None of, the, none of this I'm saying here is anything special. Uh, a very well-known hydrologist who died recently, Vit Klemish, pointed this stuff out in the 1970s and 1980s. Here's a statement from one of his papers 
about flood frequency analysis, and it basically says that the assumptions in flood frequency analysis is that anything that happened in the past can happen at any instant in time with the same likelihood, meaning that history has no validity in modern flood frequency analysis. Now that's a pretty sobering fact for people that are working with things from the past. So statistical assumptions is a whole other business. Uh, in any validities of statistics for extreme value flood frequency analysis, we have to assume that things are independently ident identically distributed and they come from the same distribution. This doesn't happen. When we study flood distributions with the causal, uh, putting the causes on the flood events, we find that different kinds of meteorological systems produce totally different extreme value flood effects. And when hydrologists analyze them, they typically lump these together in the same distribution. Now there's a fundamental paradox in all of this in that flood damages have con continued to go up as more and more money has been spent on this so-called flood science. So our roles as uh, stu students of the past are extremely important. I have suggested in other forums that we change the name of the science to the Greek words for flood and study, and we would call it plimerology, so that it would really focus on the causal scientific understanding of floods. Now, I don't think the word is going to catch on. It's pretty ugly. <laughs> but we need to advance studies of floods more effectively to be responsible to the human needs. Of, uh, human needs. We have something we can say from the past that is absolutely certain, and that is what has happened can happen. This is a possibility, not a probability, and we haven't made enough of that. We have to uh, focus more on causal understanding. As the physicist Philip Anderson once said, we, have to, we need theory, but theory should be on tap not on top. Reality is on top. And that's what we deal with when we study the past. We don't just use the past to match it to theoretical predictions. We use the past to make discoveries, to discover patterns, to see how the world is really working. I think I've, I've got a clock too, and I've got two more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there are patterns that we can utilize in the scaling of meteorological events. There are patterns we can use of the envelope curves that, that deal with the maximum sizes of events that we can produce in given size drainage basins. There are patterns that we can see between records like tree ring records here from uh, various sites in Arizona and extreme events that are plotted as the peaks to see if those extremes matches periods of low average flow or periods of high flow. And these are going to be able to tell us about causative events like atmospheric rivers, which are one of the hot topics in understanding what causes extreme floods. We can look at patterns with other kinds of paleo data sets like these from the southwestern U.S., and we can utilize a, uh, a kinds of, of um, data banks that incorporate multiple levels of information that include all of these variables. This is a much broader context of data sets. And finally, we can try to relate what we do to the complexity human dimension of society, where the natural causes of flooding and the information we provide feeds, feeds into a morass of money, profit, political opportunity, etc., that is part of the problem of the disconnect of science from society. So hopefully I've given you something to think about, and I'm sure there have to be lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> You mentioned modelers a few times. What sort of role, or where should they focus if we're talking about either a climate, a climate modeler or a hydrological modeler? Where might you encourage them to focus their efforts? 
I think they need to think beyond the idea that that the data on the reality of floods is merely a thing that needs to be matched by their model predictions. The data that, the information that we can generate from the past should be a part of generating the fundamental understanding underlying the assumptions that go into models. And I'm not talking about the assumptions of physics. I'm talking about the secondary assumptions about causative processes and the, the different levels of causative processing that actually go from climate to weather, et cetera. Obviously, there needs to be better communication, and we need to take advantage of the extreme revolution in computational power that makes modeling so, so effective. But we can't lose sight of the fact that it is reality that is the dominant force, and the modeling has to, uh, to adjust itself relative to that. And if we just spend too little time on the reality side, the modeling is going to give us powerful answers to the wrong questions. Okay. Um, the uh, aim of the study that I will present is understanding, better understanding, uh, how outburst floods, mega floods, form in overtopping lakes like the one you see in this picture. This is um, a lake formed in, in a in a frontal moraine, and when it overtopped in historical times, it developed this uh, deep uh, outlet, and it recorded the discharge along the downstream from, from this outlet. So uh, the idea is to understand when does this happen in, uh, in contrast with other situations like this landslide in uh, Pakistan uh, at about 2010, Several thousand people had to be removed, evacuated, and nothing happened. When the lake overtopped, water started circulating, simply performed no significant incision, and this is pretty much like it looks uh, nowadays. So we wanted to understand what controls that these things happen, and how can we better predict peak discharge in this setting. And uh, what we will use is numerical models, simple and complex ones. Um, let me first start with the state of the art of, of what we know about this. The problem is that most of what we know, which is a lot, it's, there is a lot of effort be behind this, uh, this single figure, it's uh, basically empirical. So it means there is a lot of natural settings where this phenomenon happened and the peak discharges were estimated and you can compare those peak discharges with, with several parameters such as water volume uh, crossing the outlet and obviously you can make some regressions. The problem is that if, if you do that regression, you, you still, for a given uh, volume of the lake, uh, you will still get three, four uh, orders of magnitude of uncertainty. And when you go to the politician or the decision maker and you tell, you tell him or her, um, look, there is gonna be a, a, a flood, but it, it's gonna be between one and 10,000 cubic meters per second, they don't like it. So we need better understanding, and, uh, um, and we especially need to go more, to, to link this phenomenon with the processes. And this is what we tried. And we, in addition to these natural settings, we were using also, uh, here. Uh, here. Uh, we also have, added some uh, natural or, sorry, uh, laboratory experiments like the one you see here. Uh, no matter how small the hole you dig into this uh, compacted sand barrier, you develop uh, high discharges of water. Uh, but it is very non-intuitive. Well, you see, I'm, I'm skipping from time to time some, some seconds so that we have time to, to watch the entire uh, experiment. But it lasts for about five minutes in total. That's the time it takes to develop what you will see. And um, it is very non-intuitive. What is the peak discharge that this setting, this very simple experimental setting uh, will develop? So think, make your bet. Uh, mentally, I mean, you don't have to bet now, but uh, it's, it's difficult to predict, yeah? What are the parameters that control this? It depends on, the, on what material you're using, and it depends on the lake of the size. 
These are things that can uh, be, that we aim to, to model. And the way we, we plan to do it, well, the mechanism is clear, I think. I don't have to insist on that. Simply the discharge along the outlet is enlarging the outlet, and this produces higher discharge, and this feeds back, uh, leading to uh, an exponential increase in the water discharge uh, along the outlet. And the idea is to uh, link the hydrograph produced here with mm, existing river erosion lows that have been tested, tested in long-term uh, landscape evolution models uh, in order to improve the understanding. But let me show you an example of a long-term landscape evolution model, not just because it's my own work and I want to publicize it, but also because it turns out we are sitting around, around here right now. Uh, this is where the meeting is, this is uh, the Pyrenees, this is the Ebro Basin surrounded by the Iberian Range and the Catalan Coastal Ranges. This is a basin that became endorheic for a long period of time and around 10 million years ago it became exorheic. It found a way through the present drainage network towards the Mediterranean. This is how these lacustrine sediments look like, presently incised by tributaries of, of the Ebro River that bring this uh, um, this uh, tertiary sediment infill back to the uh, back to the Mediterranean Sea, and we produced this uh, model already some years ago, um, which aimed to put together all the information that we had about uh, tectonic shortening along these three ranges and the erosion and the drainage evolution of of the basin. So we were constructing the Pyrenees here, and as a result the appropriate drainage evolution seemed to be pretty well reproduced. The capture of the internal drainage of the Ebro River, the opening of the Western Mediterranean. This would be Mallorca and the Balearic Islands. So what happens with these models is that they have a, a large uncertainty in at what speed do particularly the, surf the surface, processes, sur surface processes work. And this is because the erosion laws that are adopted for these models are uh, whatever the one you choose, you prefer, they always relate erosion rate, erosion rate to uh, things that essentially depend on the amount of water going down the river. Uh, so for instance, in this case, uh, you erosion rate in the stream unit power low depends on the water discharge and, of course, the slope. That's a typical power law approach. But what happens is that we have very, very bad knowledge on the average water discharge, especially in time scales in the order of millions of years, and not only on the average value, but also on the time distribution. What is the episodicity inherent to these water discharges? And because the system is very nonlinear, then it, it's, it depends on whether the same amount of water is distributed evenly through time or concentrated over uh, sharp periods, uh, short periods. <coughs> So, um, in, in essence, we have a lot of uncertainty on the erodabilities of these models, and we also have uh, additional uncertainty in, in, those, in those values uh, because of the uncer uncertainty we uh, have in paleo discharge values and climate. So, the way we uh, uh, thought we could overcome this is by using paleo floods where we know the peak discharge and use these erosion models to reproduce to fit the hydrograph and improve or uh, remove this uncertainty I'm referring to. So in the first example, this is Lake Bonneville. This is a huge lake, uh, Pleistocene Lake, 400 kilometers long by 200 kilometers uh, that overtopped around 17.5 kilo years ago. And uh, basic things we know that this, the level of the lake fell by uh, 120 meters and the peak discharge from um, evidence, geomorphological evidence uh, of high water uh, downstream from the outlet of the, of the lake uh, is about 1 million cubic meters per second. So it's a, that's a, a huge one. Uh, by the way, this, uh, the remnant today of the Lake Bonneville is Salt Lake which is around here and Salt Lake City is around here, just for reference. So what we did is we had to reconstruct the dam that was blocking this huge lake. Um, and we were doing this building on, on a one per one second DEM we had of the, of the area. 
And with a hydrodynamic 2D model, we are able to compute uh, water speed and, uh, as a, and, and how it is affected by constrictions in the bathymetry of this lake basin. And this gives us also uh, the possibility to estimate incision erosion rate, which is in this figure in the order of uh, about eight meters per day. So it's something that is happening pretty fast. So this barrier was um, eroded in timescales of uh, a few meters per, per day. Um, and one nice thing we learned out of these complex 2D uh, models is that actually we can do pretty much the same with a much simpler 0D model focused on the outlet of the lakes. And the results don't change too much. The peak discharges of 1 million cubic meters per second are still met uh, using the same erosion parameters. So what we did is we took uh, the uh, database I showed in the beginning of this talk, and for each of the mm, outburst floods uh, from overtopping lakes that was there, we estimated what was the required erodibility that we uh, need in order to reproduce the observed peak discharge. And this is the result. This, uh, what you have here as uh, blue dots, uh, left and right is for two different uh, exponents of the erosion law, and two. And um, if you compare this, uh, well, in the, in, uh, so what you have in the vertical axis is the erodibility values, and in the horizontal axis is lithology. So the harder the lithology, the higher the erodibility. But the, the, the thing that was not so expected is that if you compare that to previous long-term river erosion models or the landscape evolution models, um, it also calculating erodibility values, the trend is approximately the same. It's comparable. Hmm? Meaning that even if our erosion model is so simplified, it's just using a simple uh, stream power law, still the values of erodibility are comparable or follow similar trends. So um, the model is also predicting that the, um, the, 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 the cloud of observations should collapse uh, when you plot peak discharge against uh, the product of area, lake area, and uh, erodibility at, at the outlet. And you see that we are still do not get rid of most of the uh, scattering in our data, unfortunately, which means uh, that the answer to the broad open question I put is um, no. We cannot match uh, our capability of improving the prediction uh, after doing this is not much better. But uh, what we think is that the fact that this uh, uh, erodibility uh, lithology relationship uh, derived from outburst is consistent with previous long-term uh, landscape evolution models is telling us, uh, it's first giving us the chance, I think, to cover the gap between long-term gradual, uh, gradual uh, landscape evolution and catastrophic events. And I think now that you guys are accumulating so much information about the episodicity of uh, flooding, uh, we are getting close to the place where you, we can put together long-term and, 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 and flooding uh, erosion contributions to the long-term landscape evolution. And the other thing it's telling us is that outburst floods are perfect, ideal natural laboratories that we should use to test better improved, more recently developed models of erosion that incorporate a more detailed process like plucking, uh, grain mobilization, abrasion, and for sure, if we do that, do that we will one day be able to improve uh, the predictability uh, of models uh, when applied to uh, overtopping lakes floods. Thank you. Can I ask about your lab experiment? Sure. That looked quite, quite neat. To what extent can it be upscaled? Obviously, you have a range of, of discharge rates that you can implement. Oh. How, how, reali how realistic do you think those sort of lab experiments are when, you, when you're scaling up to a million cubic meters per second? So your question is about uh, the experiment I showed, the video. Yeah, yeah. And how, how big can you do that? 
I suppose that would be an interesting question, is how big could you, could you do that? But also in terms of comparing it to the real world, um, does, it, does it mimic a, a, a discharge of a, cubic meter, of a million cubic meters pretty well? The physics stays the same? Well, the, the purpose of the, of, of the work was not to uh, upscale th those results. It's to take that an analog experiment yeah. as a real scenario, uh, just for a lake of a much uh, smaller surface. So the idea is to use that compacted sand as one of the, of the lithologies we want to compare with. So it's not a matter of, uh, of up upscaling. We are not uh, trying to do that. We use that as actual data. It was part of the, of the big cloud. Yeah. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I'm glad to see here uh, in uh, Zaragoza. And now, thank you. let's move to Central Asia, to Tuva region. Uh, today, this territory is characterized by ultra-continental climate. Uh, annual precipitation here is not more than 200 millimeters. Nevertheless, the uh, Altai and Tuva mountains are one of the areas on the earth. They are extensive, ice-dent lakes were formed into, into mountain depressions throughout the Pleistocene. And uh, repeated draining of its lakes uh, caused significant landscape changes downstream. Uh, the Holocene evolution of regional hydrological system was determined by geomorphological patterns with the depression after the draining last ident lakes and degradation of sartan or late worm glaciation. At the same time, the extension of last glaciation uh, is highly debat de debatable and uh, varies from ice sheet to small uh, mountain valley glaciation according to different authors. Uh, in hydrological sense, the study area uh, includes uh, Magen Buren River Basin with a relatively large syndictic hole, uh, small arc hole, and Archit Nur uh, lakes um, located uh, the uh, these lakes located in the Tuva region and Archit Nur already in Mongolia. Uh, Magen Buren river river originates from Hindictic Hole in Tuva and uh, then flow into Archit Nur in Mongolia. Uh, that's how this looks like Hindictic Hole lakes with Neville, uh, it has already two Neville, two islands, and Akhol, it's White Lake, because uh, snow from Tikhachov Ridge reflects in its water. And uh, Achit Nur, it's beneficent lake from Mongolia. Uh, in hydrological aspect study area, the northwestern periphery of the Great Lakes Basin. Uh, Nevertheless, paleoclimate changes, uh, landscape evolution, and fluvial system transformation here are less investigated, especially in comparison with uh, well studied neighboring southeastern Altai. So, the main goal of our investigations was uh, reconstruction of late Pleistocene hydrological system transformation and climate changes in this region. To achieve these goals, we use uh, different methods and radiocarbon dating and geochronological uh, data form the basis of our uh, geochronological reconstructions. Uh, generally, we uh, studied uh, more than 10 sections and uh, uh, we put uh, uh, more than uh, 15 uh, radio, new radiocarbon dates for this territory. Uh, here I will give uh, brief information about geomorphol main geomorphological features of this uh, basin. Its head was uh, located uh, on the Tuva territory, was affected by ice sheet Pleistocene glaciation, and we can find evidences of uh, significantly larger lakes uh, preserved in topography and sediments of this territory. Mm. In contrast to other intermountain depressions of the Altai Sayan mountain province, which are belong to the uh, Arctic Ocean basins, uh, floods along the Magian Burian River went to Mongolian inland drainage 
basin. Uh, and now I'll show you evidences uh, of, uh, of ice and then moraine damped lake existence in the uh, Tuvinian part of the basin and uh, the traces of the outburst uh, into Achetnur lake. Uh, here you can see evidences of ice damped paleo lakes in Hindictic Hall basin in uh, neighboring Arkhold Basin and in the tectonical widening petal-shaped uh, Magen Buren depressions. And uh, this can demonstrate a relative uh, location of ice damped Paleo Lakes there shown by circles and uh, placed at some glaciers on the, this territory. Uh, after uh, draining of uh, ice damped lakes, uh, these uh, lakes in the depressions uh, were damped by moraines. It's destroyed moraine, it's example from Akhol Basin. And now I'll show you evidences of outbuilt floods uh, from these uh, lakes. These are deep marginal channels on the both slopes of Magen Buren River Valley, and you can see one floor building for, for, for scale. It's a washed surface of uh, terminal moraines. It's a typical fluvial surface picture in the floor of Magen Buren uh, depression. And uh, it's large boulders uh, rounded and rot not rounding, which mark the uh, flood streams uh, within the floor of Magen Buren Valley. Uh, we see in the uh, tectonic George downstream, we also see uh, the large boulders on the surface of terraces and scabbling topography in different parts of the valleys. The more bright example we see uh, not far from outlet of the Magen Buren Valley into Achit Nur depressions. Very bright picture, really. And uh, now, uh, uh, I would like to talk about uh, uh, giant alluvial fan formed by river. Uh, here, Magen Buren changed its name to Bokhmuren in Mongolia. E this uh, alluvial cone is the result of uh, um, results is the results of outburst floods from Iceland lakes from Tuvinian parts and glacial meltwater floods both from Chikhachov range and Mangun Taiga uh, massive. And uh, uh, we can see uh, traces, evidences of high energetic floods both in sediments uh, of this in these alluvial fans. This uh, large boulder layer on its surface, uh, its thickness up to three, five meters. The main is about two meters high. And on the surface of this alluvial fan, uh, and not only surface is uh, some uh, typical fluvial pictures, but uh, uh, this uh, fluvial picture is uh, character for uh, surface of inside terraces, terraces inside in this uh, cone. And uh, we believe that uh, uh, it was number of high energetic, uh, relatively short single events with the progressive continuation of intensity. And uh, after ice degradation and draining of ice and then moraine damped lakes, 
residual lakes we found within the bottom of depressions, as well as fluvial uh, system which uh, connected these lakes. And further evolution of hydrological system was controlled by climate changes. Uh, and now let me uh, briefly present the uh, results of uh, climatically, of, of chronology of uh, climatically driven fluid system transformation. Uh, development of ice sheet in this region uh, was before, took place before 14,000 years ago. Uh, after uh, draining of ice and then Moranian lakes, uh, residual lakes occupied uh, Magen Buren River Valley between uh, 12 and 8.5 and kilometers ago. And last uh, high energetic floods took place here before 5,000 years ago as evidenced by paleo soil formation on the surface of low terraces. Mm -hmm. And uh, its conclusion supported by chronology of Akhol Lake draining. Uh, here Moraine Dam was destroyed before eight thousand years uh, ago, which evidenced by uh, uh, radiocarbon dates of paleo soil and carbonate pendants on the uh, boulders. And uh, depression or uh, dried, uh, bottom of dried depressions were settled uh, by human. Uh, there are uh, surface finds of Paleolithic epoch, uh, but uh, it could not help us in timing, uh, to, in, in dating uh, paleo floods because, uh, because all uh, finds are surface and uh, they are dated by very broad time period from 60 to 10,000 uh, years. And Namaz intensively settled uh, depression about three uh, three kilo years ago, and archaeological site distribution allows us determining uh, lake levels at the time of their construction. And today they observe another drying of lakes and in Tuva and Mongolia. And our concluding remarks, landscape evolution and fluvial system transformation in southwestern Tuva and northwestern Mongolia was determined by degradation of Pleistocene ice sheet, further development of ice and moraine damp lakes, their draining, drying and formation of residual lakes and uh, river network. Before 14 uh, kilo years, glaciers significantly retreat. The first half of the Holocene was warm and humid, and the second one more cold with the progressive aridity intensification in the last three kilo years. Uh, we uh, uh, make this uh, conclusion analyzing uh, uh, natural, different natural archives not only on the territory of Magen Buren River but in neighboring uh, Altai region. Oscillation of the water levels in residual lakes uh, has mainly defined by climate changes and exactly hydrological system transformation controlled human occupation in this area and obtained data allow us to explain significantly high former lakes level in the Great Lakes Basin of Mongolia in the late Pleistocene. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Do, do you know the area of the lake that produced the, the area or the volume, the area of the lake or volume of the, of the lake, the big one, or the discharge of the, of the outboard floods? estimate discharge because uh, I'm not an engineer, I'm just a and we fixed uh, evidences of these events. So it's future work and work and not of me. <laughs> but uh, uh, about areas of paleo lakes, for example, in uh, Hindictic Hall areas, it was not uh, larger because uh, slope very um, 
abrupt. So area was not very large. But in uh, Akhol Lake's uh, depression, it was uh, three or four uh, times uh, wider than more than one. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think the map with the Paleo Lake and the different settlements were very interesting to see this. And my question is, if the differences of altitudes of the archaeological sites permits to reconstruct pri precisely uh, the lake level changes, this is possible, and do you can develop a, a sort of hydrological or uh, hydroclimatological uh, curve, is it possible? I don't know, is it possible to, uh, to constrain some hydrological curve, but uh, the uh, position, location of archaeological sites allow us uh, to constrain maximum possible uh, lake level during the construction of archaeological sites. So then uh, the make map of uh, archaeological sites in Akhol uh, Basin, we saw that uh, maximum possible lake level uh, was uh, um, about uh, 10 meters uh, higher than uh, modern one. Hola, buenas tardes. Uh, my name is Cristina Lopez, and I'm going to talk to you about mega floods, but the record comes from uh, marine sediments. So we're going to switch gears a little bit here, and we're going to move to the Northeast Pacific. I would like to acknowledge, first of all, my friend and co-author, Alan Mix, and also all of these um, institutions that um, finance our research. So just to make sure that everybody is on the same page, this is the Northeast Pacific. So we have Washington, this is Washington, Oregon, California. And this was work that I was doing uh, during my PhD thesis. And all of these um, dots represent core tops that have modern conditions. So we wanted to understand regarding um, marine conditions and sea surface properties, how the diatoms associations could be calibrated and validated in order to develop transfer functions. After we had the modern um, calibration, we then would go to these two sites and perform the down course studies. Uh, at the point, many, many years ago, I was very focused into reconstruction, sea surface temperature and productivity using diatom assemblages. And just to make sure that everybody understands, diatoms are microalgae and they live anywhere as long as there is light and nutrients. And they can be um, marine, brackish, or freshwater. I also plotted here the local rivers because I was expecting to find some freshwater diatoms um, in the modern core tops. Just to put a face on the name, these are some examples of freshwater diatoms that we found in our modern calibration. And everybody, uh, everything was running very smooth until I went to our first site and we go back in time, this is the freshwater diatoms, the percentage of the assemblage, and we go back in time, and when we reach the last um, maximum, the, the last glacier, we have about 40% of freshwater diatoms in our associations. And it's kind of hard, because I was expecting to find some freshwater diatoms, but not half of the association is quite high. And so um, the way we work in the poly world is that everything that we're trying to reconstruct in the past, we need to have a modern analog. Otherwise, we'll be um, extrapolating, and that can be very dangerous. So I had to go on this modern analog quest and look at the local river runoff and also the salinity behavior of the, the freshwater plumes in order to understand if in the present, we could find such amounts of freshwater diatoms. And so, uh, sorry. When we look at the modern conditions regarding salinity values for the study area, we see that the, 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 the largest river we can find 
um, is the Columbia River. And the Columbia River actually drains about 70% of the North America. And this is the, 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 the freshwater or the, the, the freshwater plume. And also, we can see that this plume kind of goes, flows south during the summer because of the currents, and it flows north uh, because of the other current that flows north. But there is a huge decrease um, on the salinity, but the sites we were studying, they were located down here, and this is about 600 kilometers south. So the other hypothesis was, well, let's see if indeed we can find such amounts of freshwater diatoms in the core tops on the, in the modern conditions right outside of the Columbia River mouth. And we do find values of freshwater diatoms in all the core tops, but we do not find almost 40% and 50% of the, the association regarding freshwater diatoms. The contour lines here are the salinity values. So once again, you can see the Columbia River freshwater plume flowing south. And so I was back, you know, to stage zero where I couldn't really understand what's going on with this amount, anomalous amount of freshwater diatoms that has no modern analog. And then Alan asked me, because I'm from Portugal, I was in the United States for my PhD, and Alan asked me if I was aware of the um, Missoula megaplots. And I said, no, and he, said, and he goes, well, you need to go and study them because maybe that's where your signal is coming from. So I love this slide because it summarizes the Missoula floods quite well. So once again, we have the Northeast Pacific. We have Washington, Oregon, and California. This is the coastline. This, the, here is the, the position of our two sites for the down core reconstructions. And what happened was, during the last glacial, Glacial Lake Missoula was built because the, the, the Fork River was uh, dammed by the Cordillerian Ice Sheet. And these are not my estimations, these come from the, um, the references. But at some point, we have um, an ice dam for this lake that was about more than half a kilometer high. And honestly, I cannot visualize this amount of fresh water being dumped through the Columbia River into the Pacific and actually um, we're talking about at some point this type of flux. I cannot visualize this, but this, is, uh, um, this comes from the, the, the references. And so our hypothesis was that some of this freshwater actually carried all of those uh, freshwater diatoms and they were being deposited in our um, down core sites. Um, when we know that this can, can be realistic because some of the, the scavenged material, some of the flood material was actually found in the, um, the turbidites from Zumba and all. And the Missoula floods are very well studied in land and you can find them um, you can find the, the, the records and, and consequences of such um, water discharges all through the, the, the Washington and Oregon. You have the Scablan, you have the prairie ripples, you have the, the, the river canyons, you have the Scablan coulees, and everywhere in the Willamette um, Valley you can find these erratics. So I'm not questioning um, the timing or the magnitude of these floods. What I'm saying is, okay, we can find this uh, signal 600 kilometers in marine sediments from the source. So um, being a polyoceanographer, I had to come up with some transfer functions and try to estimate how much um, salinity, how much the salinity decrease we have in, the, in our um, down cores. And so what I have here is once again the modern calibration and I plotted the, the, the values of the freshwater diatoms versus the annual salinity values for each of these uh, locations. 
And I tried to come up with an equation that would allow me to estimate salinity for the past 30,000 years. And I would like to call your attention that these are the estimation errors. On average, it's 0 0.6 salinity units, but it can go from 0 0.26 if you are on this side of the equation to um, one salinity unit if you go down here because the confidence level um, at the bottom of the equation is um, smaller. And so back in 2009, Alan and I actually published the salinity re reconstructions based on the fact that we have the Missoula flood um, water being dumped in the Pacific Ocean and reaching our site. So what we have here is um, the last 20, 30,000 years, and we have this, um, sorry, the, 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 it's reversed. So going down, there's an increase in the amount of freshwater diatoms. We do have the error envelope on average. And I also plot it because you can have a plantonic and benthic freshwater diatoms. And we were trying to understand if there was a lake or a river in orange um, for these different species of freshwater diatoms. Also, um, because a single proxy cannot tell the entire story, we do have the same signal for decreasing salinity coming from the forum isotopes. But this is Alan's work, so anybody that has questions, I can give, give you his email and you can talk to him, because I'm not an expert on um, this type of isotopes. So um, besides these uh, mega floods, we also, ha we also have um, water coming from other sources like, I'm oh, sorry, beneath the, the glaciers. This is just an example. I was lucky enough in 2014 to take this picture in Alaska. That's what fresh water coming below the, the glacier. And also, so we had this record, and because one core doesn't tell the entire story, we had two sites in that map. We also did the same study for the other core, and now we have also have lots of freshwater diatoms coming into the same place, and we were able to match it with turbidites, sand layers, and also um, Missoula flood, es flood estimates from um, land geologists and people that were dating the floods in land. So just to conclude, I just wanted to take this passage home that you can pick the flood signal from marine sediments using such um, proxies like uh, diatoms. And we know that the, the Missoula floods uh, reach south, but the next month, we have a cruise to collect cores from the north of the mouth of the Columbia River, and we're trying to map and constrain the influence of the mega floods just to try to understand what was the impact in the circulation of the North Pacific. So that's all. Thank you for your attention. You mentioned uh, north of the Columbia mouth. Are you familiar with uh, Hendy's core off of uh, Vancouver Island? Yes. You, you might want to mention that. that. That's a provenance study. It, um. Yeah, I mean, we do know at this point that in the south it's well constrained because we have the same signal in both cars. And I've been trying to look north of the Columbia River, and that's an, uh, an interesting hypothesis that I have to consider. The work I'm going to present here are uh, the results of four uh, field expeditions to this particular area in uh, Patagonia by a multidisciplinary team of researchers uh, from different, different countries. And our objective was to study a uh, glacial lake of floods uh, that has occurred in the uh, Baker River catchment, which is the second largest river in uh, Chile and is located in the eastern part of the Andes and the, uh, at the northern Patagonian ice field. Uh, this this uh, river catchment is the second largest one in Chile and also drains the second largest lake in South America, 
that we have here is uh, named as Lago Buenos Aires in the Argentinian side and Lake uh, General Carrera in the Chilean part. The Baker uh, River uh, burns here in the lake and goes along 175 kilometers until the uh, junction in the Pacific Ocean. The mean discharge uh, currently is 1,100 cubic meters per second. The physiographic uh, evolution of this catchment, as well as the paleohydrology, has been a control or, or influenced by the glaciation history of the northern Patagonian ice field. Here is a cartoon of this ice field uh, at about the LGM. Uh, at, th at this point, the, the, the ice front was uh, entering the Argentinian Patagonian side. And since then, it started to retreat. And as it was retreating, on the uh, depression sinks that were excavated by the glaciers were occupied by these uh, large uh, lakes, the Lake General Carrera on the northern part, and also the Lake Cochrane in the southern part. At that point, about 13,000 years ago, these lakes were draining towards the uh, Atlantic Ocean through some rivers that currently are dry. And at that time, these lakes were imposed by ice dam that uh, <coughs> forced the water to drain to, to that side. At some point, uh, the ice dam breached and uh, found a new way to drain towards the Pacific Ocean. This, uh, in the way they, these lakes were drained has been described previously by people working on, on lake evolution and also on the uh, glacial evolution of the northern Patagonian ice field as a dramatic uh, uh, change in the, in, the, in the water level that, uh, that was associated also to a large flood. But so far, nobody has studied evidences of this, uh, we can call it mega flood. So uh, one of our first uh, objectives of this war is to test the, this mega flood hypothesis of the breaching of the an ice dam or moraine imposing this uh, lake that occurred sometimes uh, about 12,000 years ago that produced this dramatic uh, lowering in lake level and the shift of the uh, drainage from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Then also, uh, we also uh, tried uh, to study and quantify the frequency and timing of uh, subsequent uh, Holocene glacial lake overflats in the mid uh, Baker coming from the Upper Colonia River and the Neff River. And um, one of, of our objectives, and actually was the first one uh, when we went to the, in the first expedition, was to place in the historical context the zone of the recent flooding that started in 2008 uh, from uh, Glacial Lake uh, Lago Cachetu in the Upper Colonia. So this is a uh, Google view and uh, to show you how uh, uh, what we think was the, uh, the origin of the impounding of this uh, Lake uh, General Carrera about, uh, about uh, uh, 12,000 years ago. We found uh, frontal moraines from uh, Plomo Glacier that were located at this position. Since then, the retreat of this glacier star, uh, um, uh, came to this place where we still have uh, another moraine and the water started to pour into the, into the former uh, Baker River. The lake travel at this point was about uh, 100 of 100 meters. The first evidence we find in, in this uh, route of the, of the mega flood was are uh, these mega, flood, uh, mega ripples uh, produced on this bar surface. You see here um, they will have a length of uh, about 600 meters and the height of these ripples are about three meters. Our uh, first estimation using uh, uh, hydraulic modeling is that these ripples will be uh, formed under a water uh, flow depth of 6 to 15 meters. We have mapped all the uh, features associated to this large flood. Uh, there are many uh, erosion features, mainly uh, in uh, relation to inner channel uh, formation, deepening the, these uh, very narrow uh, valleys. 
and on areas where you have more space, we have accumulation of uh, variety of sedimentary uh, landforms. Some of them, as this one, that are located upper in the upper part of, of, of the valleys, uh, shows that the water depth in this uh, location will be about 70, uh, 70 meters. I'm going to show, show you a detail of this. This is uh, this eddy bar, what you see here, the forest of cross bedding, um, and the uh, thickness of this bar is about 25 meters. We have tried to date this with OSL. It has been quite complicated, and actually this date uh, will overestimate the age of the flow. Um, downstream, we have also this uh, uh, boulder bar features that has been reshaped, has reshaped former uh, moraine sediments. And they have uh, on top these big boulders with up to seven meters in diameter. We have done uh, um, an estimation using a one-dimensional hydraulic model, the headgrass, trying to see the, uh, the discharge associated to these uh, 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 sedimentary evidences. Um, it shows that uh, our modeling, which it shows that uh, the peak discharge uh, will be of at least 110,000 cubic meters per second. Um, the other sources of uh, flooding during the Holocene are placed here in the upper uh, Neff uh, Valley. Uh, currently, we have here the Neff Glacier and also on the upper Colonia Glacier. Here, you find these uh, lakes both on the frontal part of the, of the glaciers but also on the, la on the lateral uh, drainage systems. We uh, have studied sequences of uh, uh, slag water sediments associated to this uh, glacial lake overflow in this section and also downstream of the Colonia Glacier. Um, in, in, the, in the downstream of the Neff Valley, the Holocene uh, slag water sediments are inset on the mega flat uh, sediments. In this site that we call it Fortuna, uh, which is lo located here in the, in the map on one of the lateral side, we find uh, three uh, benches, one at 23 meters, 16 meters, and 14 meters. The upper one, um, you, we see here this sequence of uh, slug water sediments with up to uh, 25 uh, flat units that were accumulated between 4,000 and uh, uh, 4,000 and 2,500 uh, GSBP. Uh, at that time, there was uh, some kind of interruption on the, on the uh, sedimentation of, of uh, the floods uh, and uh, the development of this pozolic ludisol. On top, we have another sequence of uh, additional seven uh, floods that uh, overcome this, this elevation. On the lower Fortuna bench that we see here, there is a sequence of uh, flat sets uh, and uh, interrupted by the development of these uh, uh, paleosoils. Uh, we were able to date these uh, uh, paleosoils using radiocarbon, and it shows that uh, they correspond to uh, flat units that were deposited over the last uh, 2,000 years. Interesting thing is that there uh, has been an increase in the frequency uh, of these uh, uh, floods or, or glacial lake over floods uh, over this period. And the last uh, sequence of, of flood uh, that will correspond to the little ice age, the frequency was about one flood every 10, uh, 10 years. Here there is a correlation between the uh, uh, different benches still we need to take more. And in relation to the magnitude, we have carried out a hydraulic modeling along, along, this, along the three and a half kilometers and shows here the water surface profile that will match the elevation of the upper Fortuna uh, bench. And the value that we obtain from the model is a peak uh, discharge of 10,300 uh, cubic meters per second. Here I plot also the um, what the surface profile for the largest uh, recorded flood in the in the gas station, that is uh, one order of magnitude uh, lower than the largest uh, glacial lake over flood. The other source of uh, 
uh, flooding is the upper colonia um, and actually the Lake Cache and uh, Lake Arco and we have studied here the sediments. Um, um, here there are two floodplains, the lower and higher floodplain. The higher floodplain shows a sequence quite uh, similar in timing um, to the one I described before in the Fortuna. Uh, multiple flood has increased the frequency towards the, this uh, uh, timing of the Pozzoli Lubisol and then the activation over the, in the Little Ice Age. Um, since uh, 2008 has occurred 16 flood events that are they were uh, uh, coming from this lake, the uh, Lake uh, Cachetu, that drained subglacially the, uh, the, uh, the Colonia Glacier. And um, as I said, they produced 16 flood events. Most of them were in the, with the charges between 2,000 and uh, 3,500. 3, and only the larger one was of about 4,200 that didn't come to the uh, upper uh, level of the floodplain that would require higher discharge. Just going to the conclusions, as you see here, the last, since the last deglaciation, um, the morphosedimentology of this valley has been controlled by these uh, floods. Uh, the, uh, we uh, demonstrate the occurrence of a mega flood at about uh, uh, 11 to 8,000 years ago with that discharge. And then during the Holocene, the glacial lake overflows uh, continues occurring uh, with uh, a first cluster over, uh, that occurred in between two phases of soil formation and then subsequent floods were smaller until the Little Ice Age. We have recorded these 16 floods in the, uh, in the recent times, but none of them overcome the, the uh, limit of the higher discharge. And also, it, very interesting, a uh, supply uh, uh, study that this data haven't been considered to uh, some proposed uh, scheme uh, project to build dams in this river, and that will make a big difference. Thank you very much for your attention. How long is the mega flood last for? Uh, the duration of the flow. Well, you have the volume, you have the peak flux. Yeah, but we long? made an estimation. I don't remember. I think it was about a uh, few days, not much, probably three so or the, four days. So the total uh, discharge volume is quite small? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, so my title is Integrating Lake Sediment Reconstructions in Norwegian Flood Frequency Scenarios. And uh, after hearing the talk by Vic Baker, at the start of this session, you all know that this is important to do, and I will show you how we will try to do this in, in, in Norway. So as Bruno said, I, I have been working with lake sediment reconstructions of, um, of floods over the last 10 years or so in, in Norway, and we have some sites going on, and we have some sites that are uh, published, and... and um, our experience with the lake sediment records is that there are, of course, some challenges and, and there are uh, some advantages and, of course, some potentials, what will come next. Uh, so compared to, to instrumental data, we know that our data, of course, they are a bit noisy and there are large uncertainties uh, in, the, in the lake sediment records due to, for example, the HDAP models. Um, we have uh, a challenge to correlate our uh, sedimentary signal to the, to the magnitude of the flood uh, to make the, the data usable for, for example, a, a hydrologist. Um, <coughs> but there are also, also some advantages and potential. There is uh, a big advantage that we can constrain the natural variability of the, of the flood, of the discharge in the catchment. And there is uh, a potential for having universal methods that can be applied on, uh, on different lakes in a large area. Um, and there are a lot of lakes around. So it's just to start coring. And there is indeed a potential for, doing, uh, for uh, estimating the magnitude of floods uh, from the lake sediment archives. 
Yeah. So at the same time, the hydrologist they tells us that the flood frequency analysis uh, they have a problem with the short time scale. And the picture there is an example from uh, from Western Norway, a big flood in Western Norway in 2014. Uh, it was the biggest one in the instrumental record. Uh, <clears throat> so the local community they asked themselves, how often can we expect this kind of flood? And when you look at this picture, you see also the clear connection between the, the hydrology, the river, and the society around, and also the sedimentology. You see the river, it cuts in the, it cuts in the banks, it under digs the houses, the houses, there were three houses here, that were washed away by the flood. And all of this is, of course, transported downstream and deposited in the lake. So there is a potential for extending the observations with lake sediment records to overcome this challenge with the short time period. So to do this, we need to understand how to identify and to quantify the footprint of the uh, sedimentary footprint of the flood. And we need to know how to implement this polyflow data into the hydrological models. And again, to make the people in this village uh, ready to prepare for the future, we need to relate this results from this into a climate model scenario. And this is exactly what we intend to do in, uh, in a project that will start up later this year. So I don't have too much data to show yet, but I will show you some, some examples how, how, we, how we can do this and how we aim to do this. So the aim of the project is to improve the scientific knowledge base for flood risk governance in Hordaland municipalities. This is the local government in, in the western part of Norway. So we want to do this by producing polyflood records from lake sediments at the Department of Earth Science, where, where I am working, sorry. And we want to <coughs> integrate these polydata into uh, hydrological models with the help of the hydrologist working in the Norwegian Water Resource and Energy Directorate. And we want to relate this to downscale climate models uh, to generate scenarios. So you need to downscale the model to have a local climate scenario for each individual catchment. And <clears throat> the last point, sorry, we have the Hordaland, the local um, government, is a partner in this project. So we want to implement our findings directly into the, into the decision making in this region of, of Norway. So this, uh, this is exciting. But first to the, to the, to the paleo records. So we need to produce some paleo, paleo flood records that is sort of edible for the for the modelers. And one way of doing this is to, to choose uh, a threshold lake. An example of this is in the Gloma River system. Um, at this point here, the river makes a sharp bend towards the, towards the west. But whenever there is a flood exceeding this 1,500 cubic meter per second, the river splits up in two. This is a zoom in of the bend in the river now. And flood water escapes the main channel over this big lake here and across the threshold and into this small lake here where we have sediment coast <coughs> and continues towards Sweden. So if you take a core from this lake here we can s and find the flood water, we have a minimum estimate of the flood, 1,500 cubic meter per second. And this is something the modelers can use in the hydraulic model. So this is <coughs> a zoom in. Now we have the main river up here, and the north is now pointing this way. And we know from historical and instrumental records that the flood actually crosses this threshold. So in 1967, there was a major flood. This is the normal situation in 1967. The water level of the lake was 143. There's a threshold here at 
146 and a half meter. But during the flood, uh, the water level was raised. There was a spillover over the threshold into this lake. So coring this lake, <coughs> we find this kind of sediment. I have a poster this afternoon. I can show you the full record and the age model and everything. But so then, <coughs> applying state-of-the-art sedimentary analysis on, on this type of record, we can, we can uh, identify these layers in the core. We can, you have seen examples of this also earlier today with XRF scanning. We can use the CT scanner for, uh, for X-ray images, the hyperspectral core scanning. You can get the really high resolution. Um, and there are a range of methods you can use. Um, <clears throat> this is one example where you see the sediment core down here. It's almost five meters. We measure the magnetic susceptibility, and it peaks in these mineralogenic flood layers in the Gitya. Uh, background sample. And then we calculate the rate of change in this magnetic susceptibility. So when there is a high rate of change, there is a rapid increase in the flood transported material, and this will mark the onset of the, onset of the, of the river flood. We can put the threshold, and then we have some sort of an objective way of picking out this when there is a flood and when there is not flood. There are also ways to, <clears throat> we can identify the, the different triggering mechanisms or source areas on this, um, in this type of record. This is an example from, uh, from a flood record in southern Norway where we measured uh, geochemical and magnetic properties on the individual flood layers. And we see there are different types of flood layers. They have a different sedimental, sedimentology. And this can be related to, to the process behind the individual flood, right? So they group into the two groups here. There is the rainstorm group, or we, we interpret them as a, as a rainstorm uh, process behind these floods. And there is a snowmelt group, and then there are a group there that we can't really differ. And then we can plot this on a time axis, and you can see how it's changing over time, if it's dominated by the one or the other type of, of uh, flood. Again, you can also do a historical validation. We've seen this before, and this is a CT image of, the, of a one by one centimeter cube of the sediment core. You see this layers within the core, and if you have a good uh, lead dating, you can, you can correlate this to uh, known historical events. Yeah. So, as you have also seen, there are lots of flood records available around Europe. This is just an example figure I uh, picked out from a publication we had a few years ago. And <clears throat> we all have these same different challenges, on, uh, but it's possible to, to overcome this and to make records that can be used into the models. And then we can look at the large scale variability within area. The 4,000 year shift have been pointed out before and there is also something happening in 2000. So this can be related to maybe to large scale circulation patterns, but this is something we have to look into. Right? Anyway, but my time is running out, so I have to go back to the how we can use this data to update the flood frequency analysis. So back to the, the GLOMA example. <clears throat> Here we picked out 670 years of paleoflow data, 155 floods, from this sedimentary record. And then we combined it with the systematic data, the instrumental record. And we can put in the historical record as well. We know of 10 historical floods in this catchment. And then our colleagues, uh, the hydrologists, they can 
do some fancy statistics on this. It's by easy and don't ask me how they do it. But there is an R package available. You can put in this kind of, of data and you can come out with flood analysis, flood frequency analysis diagrams. So here you have the magnitude and the return period. So this is a bit messy, but you see here the systematic data, the instrumental data, uh, with these crosses here and there is a fitting towards it. And if you include the historic data points, you get a completely different story, right? So for instance, the 500 year flood increases with 600 uh, cubic meter per second. <clears throat> but the interesting part here also is when they use the polio data, the green line, yeah, we, uh, we see that it's following quite closely to the, to the systematic data. And this is only one catchment, so it could be, um, could be a coincidence, but it also highlights the the non-stationarity in the data, for instance, that the historical period might be anomalous high compared to the, the long uh, polo signal. So then again, next step is to, to, uh, to connect this to downscale climate model. I don't have time to talk about this, but it's now it's possible to go into a downscaling climate model into s single catchment area. So this we will have the modelers do. <coughs> so to sum up, <coughs> there indeed there is a need for long-term data in flood frequency analysis, and polio data may provide this, assuming that we know the process. And assimilation is possible if we bring the right people and communities together. Uh, it's possible to create polio data that is usable in the models and it's possible for the models to adapt a bit to the climate, to the polio data. And then the downscale mo climate models may provide the local scenarios that is necessary for the lo local decision making. Thanks. Can you go back to the slide where you have the number of floods per 30 years? This one, no? The other one, before. The one, that one. Yeah. Why 30 years? Sorry? Why did you choose the number to plot the number of floods for 30 years? For 30 years? Yes. Why 30? Well, this has to do with what we are uh, able to, to detect and with the edge model also. So, so it's... <laughs> it's... Uh, well, it's more or less random to choose the time period. 30 years is the, is the typical climate period. You, you um, average over 30 years the, uh, the weather data to get the climate data. So, so it's, uh, in that case, it's a, it's a useful period. But it, uh, it's sort of the limit of how low we can go to have uh, reliable data, I would say. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. So first of all, I would like to, 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 to say that this is a collaborative effort study with my colleagues from the University of Geneva and also uh, research and technicians uh, from the Irrigation and Flood Control Department of Kashmir. And this was a project that it was initiated because a stream flood event took place in 2014. We were interested at that time, and we were initiating some uh, research in this area. This is just the outline. First, I would like to show you some pictures about the flood that took place in 2014. I would like also to, to show some features about the hydrometeorological condition of this stream flood. But then, what I would like to, to, to show you is to, to the, the, the records that we uh, uh, obtained from tribunes, but also from historical archives in this area, to really put in a longer context uh, the, the, the flood that took place in 2014. So in the early of September of this year, a really extreme flood took place in the Yellow River, in Yellow Catchment, located in the Kashmir Valley, which is 
located between uh, Pakistan and India. This was really a big flood that submerged uh, the main cities, cities with more than one million of population, for several days, causing several dead people and a, a lot of economical uh, 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 losses. Just based on the remote sensing, uh, from the analyze of the aerial pictures in this uh, time, only between uh, Anantang and Santang, in eight, Sapore, sorry, 80 kilometers, uh, the flooded area was 500 kilometers square. But at the Srinagar, which is the main city of Kashmir, the flood water or the water depth, it was up to five meters. And this water depth remains for several days. You can imagine the circumstance in, this, in these regions. More than 300,000 people had to be rescued from the city. It was all the hospitals, all the health uh, system was co were collapsed. And the economical losses was estimated after the flood on 16 billion of dollars. Uh, uh, it was a catastrophe. And it makes some uh, uh, imprints in the, in, the, in the population after that. But we need to consider the constraints. And specifically in this region, we need to talk about the Indus water trade, which is a special uh, trade between India and Pakistan uh, that was signed in 1916. And make, uh, uh, it's important to tell that uh, even if the Yellow River was located in the Indian territory, the Indus water trade uh, give all the rights for the water governance to Pakistan. So this creates some conflicts and it's also creating some constraints in the flood management for the Indian uh, side, for sure. I would like to talk about this flood first about the hydrometeorological conditions, but then contextualize in the longer perspective. So if we look at the train data set, satellite image based uh, products, we observe the moisture of the rainfall coming from the Arabian Sea it was uh, uh, the event took place because the long lasting precipitation coming from the Arabian Sea. Uh, only in these uh, records, we observed that the September was the highest record in this area, a specific area. Kashmir is here, this area. The same feature is provided by the CPC Morph dataset, also satellite based uh, uh, products. You can see how the, from the Arabian Sea was developing the, the, the moisture, the addiction of moisture, producing the rainfall in the upper part. But if we have a look at the, at the field-based measurements, we observe that these products were, at that time, more or less in agreement with the, with the Gauge stations. We observe daily rainfall for, by 114 millimeters. And we observe that most of the precipitation took place in the north and uh, east part of the catchment, specifically on 4th of September. If we are at the, at the same time looking at the most uh, longest uh, series from the IMD, Indian Meteorological Department, we uh, uh, estimated the rainfall of these states in more or less 50 years uh, return period. But we were also interested to see which were the synoptic situations and we did uh, uh, some analysis, self-organization maps analyzed to identify the synoptic pattern related with these floods. And we observed that the uh, higher altitude uh, developed of a throat in the uh, 200 millimeters, but uh, at lower altitude, we observed a high level pressure over Russian, creating a blocking pattern in these regions. Uh, the interesting things here is that if we compare with the recent flood events in the region, the pattern matched quite perfectly. If this is uh, the patterns that are related with the 2013 disaster in North India, and the same we can say for the Pakistan floods in 2010, that it was uh, linked with uh, uh, the summer heat waves in Russia. So it looks like uh, these patterns 
may create, uh, uh, may affect uh, a dark region. And this is may, uh, at least important for, for, for future or also to interpret the past. What then we did is to try to, to compile all the flood records in the regions, and we apply three different methods. First, one important method is not easy if uh, we are working in this area is to get the systematic records, the data. This is uh, a challenging process for these regions because uh, uh, sometimes it's difficult. Uh, then we also apply three rings analyze in the upper part of the catchment in the Gauget areas. And then also we were uh, focused uh, the historical archives that uh, we observed at that time that they were very rich, specifically in, the, in Kashmir. This is how it looks like now after compiling all the flow records we uh, were able to get all the information from the, from the valley here are all the locations of the, of the Gauge stations, and here are the location of the three rings assessments. With this material, we have performed trends analysis and also regional approaches, but we will not talk, I will not talk about this. What I will talk, it was about the three rings and stuff, uh, reconstruction and the historical reconstructions. When we were talking about the three rings, we were to the upper part of the catchment, we were looking to the places like this where we can observe trees growing close to the river. And if we are looking at the specific trees, we can also observe damage on trees that are uh, related with the transport of boulders of different materials. We were analyzing the tree ring records of these disturbed trees to interpret the ring with uh, patterns and to relate the disturbances with the flood occurrence. Also, we were looking at bedrock channels, uh, stable channels to reconstruct the magnitude and to constrain the uncertainties because the mobility are changing in geometry. So this was the methods related with the three rings and also the methods related with the historical archives. We were surprised when we were there because we found a rich uh, variety of, uh, of archives uh, uh, and we try to compile everything uh, to create the, the story, to tell the story. So this is uh, uh, some pictures after the 1893 events uh, in Srinagar. We observe, we get uh, information since this age. Uh, we also observe, uh, we also get direct observations, pictures, and no continuum measurements from the irrigation and flood control department. We observe a uh, major description of these events in the Walter Lawrence uh, 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 book uh, about the Kashmir Valley. And we try to, to, com to, to relate the magnitude in terms of impact of these uh, historical events with these uh, major events to, to, to include with the systematic records. So this is how it looks like the compilations. Uh, here we can see the floods. Here is the tree rings, which are con completely constrained by the age of the trees. Uh, but also the historical archives provide us information about the famines and also uh, episode about frozen uh, 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 episode. So here there are some descriptions. Uh, this is a, a documentary account, everything in, in the 11th century. Uh, describing uh, failure mechanisms related with earthquakes, landslides, and, uh, and big floods in the area. This is, uh, again, another example of these uh, uh, flood events uh, in the Rahatanagini of Hanarajas book, <laughs> uh, written in this, uh, uh, also in this, in this period, uh, describing uh, uh, big events destroying uh, all the settlement in the area. And finally, this is uh, another example. We account more than uh, the most important uh, account, historical accounts in the regions. 
Uh, this is the Walter Lawrence book where we observe even description of a specific uh, flood events in 1993, also in 1936, in 1992 uh, as well. The interesting is that uh, uh, many of the floods were related with the famines because the crops were destroyed and they caused uh, a lot of economical damage and, and they suffer uh, by famines. So what we did is to inspection this data set and to uh, study the stationarity of the, co of the floor uh, uh, compilations to, to, to try to include uh, this information in the flood frequency uh, analyze. So finally, we sum up with the period since uh, uh, 17th to now. And we include the, the marks and the estimation of the magnitude based on the models uh, that they have in the in the Srinagar. And we observe that only including the, the, the systematic records, uh, the historical records, so we uh, improve or at least change uh, significantly the return period of the 2040 flood event, which was uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, according with the, with the population here, but in fact, we observe uh, much bigger in the recent past. So just to sum up, uh, uh, I want to say that uh, the 2040 flood event was the largest in Kashmir since the Indus water tribe was signaled, but in fact it was not the, the, the largest in, in the history. And it shares some similarities in terms of the hydrometeorological condition with the 2013 uh, disaster in the northern India, but also 2010 in Pakistan, which is relevant for the future. Our compilation of flood point out a high vulnerability of these regions and describe even failures mechanisms uh, related with the earthquakes, landslide, flood nexus. Only including the systematic records, clearly the flood is underestimated. And even if we include the historical records, the 2040 flood event that it was supposed to be one of the biggest, in fact, it has a return period much uh, lower than expected at the beginning. And I think that uh, uh, our compilation of flood uh, in this region it can be relevant to rethink the disaster management policies in the context of the Indus water trade for the future uh, in this region. And with this, I would like to, to, to thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Do, do you have any idea how good was the weather forecast for this 2014 event? This yeah. is my first question. My second question is, uh, do you have any idea about what are the future plans for the region or? Uh, uh, in fact, uh, science, uh, it was the results of one small project that we have for during one and a half year. And since this uh, works, we are now quite well engaged to the stakeholder there. Uh, I know that uh, after the flood, they set up a radar, uh, uh, operation radar in, this, in the region for the future. So that can be used for forecasting in the future, but until this moment, they were not. Uh, we have uh, the GLOFAS, which is the forecast uh, large scale. We have a look in the forecast of this flood during this event and others uh, in 2015, 2017. I didn't just talk about that. Um, actually, the, the, the model doesn't work uh, very well. So now we are uh, working with them or trying to support them. Uh, to understand uh, the link between the lakes that they are in the regions and the water table and the, and the river. And we are in the process to develop a model that allow them to use the water table with the Gauge station in the upper part to forecast in the lower part. But there is not so far uh, a model or a system for that. What kind of historical data you used and in what language it was? Who, who worked with them? The historical sources, you mean? Yes. Well, the historical sources... Here, well, here, I have a, a summarized. So, the historical sources has been worked by people there. Uh, in the, the, they, they work in the past with these historical sources. 
um, by us as well. And the interesting thing is that because uh, this region was uh, British in, in former time, mm. many of the books has been worked, worked in the past and has been translated to the English. Many of the books. So it has been more or less easy. So these are the, the primary sources. Almost all said this has been, I think he's, this has well, but we were not able to get it. And someone in Kashmir helped us with these uh, tra translations. But the other has, tra has been translated to the English. They are the most important, according with historians in the region, uh, books, more reliable for, for this period. And we also have uh, secondary sources or other sources, but in English. So we want to, to, to speak uh, with all the co-authors that you see here. Uh, they come from different places and uh, they have different uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, scientific background. And uh, the reason is, uh, I will tell you later. So the title is Integration of Multidisciplinary Datasets to Reconstruct a Comprehensive Paleo flood picture in the Denise Alps, which you can see here in this nice picture. This is the headwater of the Aru River. So the thing is uh, that we, the, the idea came up uh, from the last uh, um, annual meeting in Grenoble, and uh, we said, let's say together, we have a lot of people working in the Venice Oberland, put the data together and have a look on it, how uh, we can combine this data. So we have uh, lake records, uh, we have floodplain sediments, geochemistry uh, analysis we do there, then historical flood damages, uh, lichenometry, uh, and also there are the works uh, with the glaciers. Um, <coughs> as you can see here, uh, so people uh, specialized on historical data, uh, Oliver Wetter, Bruno Willem, Benjamin Amann, Stephanie Wirth, Lukas Glor, the people which work with lake records, uh, Juan Carlos Peña on paleoclimate modeling, and uh, Philippe Cavallo and uh, me, uh, we are working on floodplain deposits. So the, the uh, catchment, which you can see here, is uh, from the west to the east. Uh, this is the Kanda catchment. Uh, the catchment uh, areas you find here listed up there. It's around uh, between 400, 600 uh, square kilometers. Uh, this is the Kanda River. This is the Lucina catchment. And then you have here the Hasli Aru catchment here to the east. Um, these are the locations of uh, the data uh, that we use in uh, our study area. Uh, also um, very important is that the altitudes are quite different. So we have on one hand the large catchments uh, with the data so which comes from around uh, 600 meter uh, uh, sea level, uh, meters above sea level uh, with highest peaks uh, around uh, Finsterau, uh, more than 4,200 meters. But we also have a very high uh, uh, located uh, records, uh, which are on an altitude of about 1,500 meters here, Lake Oshinen, Lake Ithik, uh, 2,100 meters, and so on. Uh, and these are very small catchments. So therefore, you see, we, we are trying to put things together which are different at scale. So uh, this is the final result, and this is the good news. So, so you have your coffee break now. Um, but of course I will continue. This is only the thing, uh, think about this. These are curves. Don't want to go immediate, but this we expected for, uh, to get from our work. We brought to integrate with the floodplain paleo flood uh, records from geochemistry, uh, uh, XRF scans, for example, the flood layers, to all the historical data that we get. This is this flood, so floods goes down. I probably have to say this. And these are lake records, uh, lake Erschienen. And uh, you see that the curves uh, visually uh, correlates quite well, uh, the last 300 years, for example, the 400 years, and uh, this is what normally we expect from this work. But we have to go in detail, and we see then the problems that we get. Uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, the approach from our uh, uh, flood working group. Uh, we want to put the data together, and therefore we have subgroups uh, here. Uh, which have to uh, uh, match together the data of the, uh, the lacustrine, and fluvial sediments, pelotemps, and so on. So there, the, the, the thing was when we last year we were discussing about that, we felt the first discussion: oh, how to match the which type of data we use? This is not only a problem only 
of uh, integration of data of uh, multiplexy approach. It's also data which are very similar here. So this is this kind of uh, problem that we get. And then of the course to educate all the data then uh, to a common data set, so this is very challenging and we don't resolve this uh, yeah, in, in, uh, in a short time. But anyway, some question here. Um, which proxies are suitable uh, for robust flood signals? Uh, which series are comparable, which are not comparable? Similar different sensitivities of the proxies uh, according to original settings, environment, and processes. And then at which time scale multiproxy paleo flood, uh, paleo flood integration makes sense? Uh, the last question, of course, uh, we heard it uh, several times, uh, which series are allowed to reconstruct paleo discharges, which are important for uh, flood uh, hazard assessment. So first, now we go to, uh, to the type of archives, so the historical archives, so the data, these are the flood intensities, here are the magnitudes of the historical floods of the last, let's say, 500 years, with some gaps you can see here. This is the uh, Hasli Are, this is the Lucina uh, River, and this is the Kanda River that uh, there are previous days, but we uh, reworked them, we reanalyzed them, put uh, calibrated as the BSL data, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, the data sets from the VSL uh, uh, Institute in, in, in Switzerland and so on. Uh, and then we integrated the, the data, as you can see. So we see some peaks here and some clusters, if you want to say that, um, uh, from the three uh, catchments, the flood frequency of the, the th uh, three uh, catchments. And uh, because they all flow into, at the end, into the Lake Toon, and this is the outflow of Lake Toon you find over there. So you uh, see, uh, these are the clusters here, a nice correspondence of some flood peaks. So this seems to be that it works and to define uh, some flood periods and also single events. The next thing is the flood layers of the uh, lake uh, records. This gets a little bit more tricky. As you can see, this is, this is a Lake Oshinen uh, uh, record here. There's a Lake Ifik uh, record uh, and the uh, Lake uh, Grimsesee uh, record. Uh, these are the data from Lukas Glur uh, and this is the data from Benjamin Ammann. And you see that the frequency, the density of the data is absolutely different. Uh, and therefore, uh, Bruni says uh, uh, it is very tricky to combine the data. Uh, although uh, what you can do is uh, we can uh, make a, a threshold level there so that is probably more comparable uh, than we can apply uh, there also uh, running sums, uh, as you can see here. And I don't want to discuss this. Um, what is the meaning of that? I only want to highlight that although that the lakes are very close, very close and very close area, you get in some e period to get a reverse uh, response. And uh, this we have to take into con consideration if you want to integrate the data. So, next are the fluvial sediments. Uh, this is our, our works uh, that are presented uh, in the Grenoble meeting and, and the ETU and also in the United States. I don't want to go into detail. Look only on the curves. This is a very s small catchment, four square kilometers. This is a, a larger catchment. Uh, uh, catchment about 600 uh, uh, square kilometers and uh, visual correlation you can see here we also did some statistics but it, it fits quite uh, quite well we can distinguish the cooler climate courses warmer climate courses but anyway so but always saying this the, the frequency or the, the here is, is is not high it's it's medium frequency let's say like this we, now this is a smoothed curse by nature processes and probably also by statistics now we go into the integration uh, according to the catchments. Uh, again, first the Hasli catchment that we uh, presented before. Don't say too much. Also, what to highlight this is our curve from the uh, uh, geochemistry proxies, as you can see here, about the last uh, 700 years. And only want to say that that's calibrated by historical uh, data and so on. And only to, to look if they correlate with the Lake Grimsel, which is in the, in the headwater catchment, a small lake. Uh, it was a small catchment, and indeed, uh, that these are uh, the flood layers they get, and uh, they uh, are very close uh, to this uh, periods of increased uh, flooding uh, in the floodplain around uh, 580 meters above uh, sea level. So the Kanda, there we don't have uh, um, uh, floodplain uh, sediments, so we focus now on the. Uh, on the uh, on one hand, on the, the documentary data, which you can see here, and these are the uh, lake uh, of 
the, the flood layer thickness of the lakes, which is above lakes, this is very good to have a good precision of good chronological control. And uh, now you have to go in this, this is flat, and go down in the uh, flat. So, yeah, so both direction. And it's good to observe what's occurring here. So, if you want, if although we know this is fantastic, uh, fantastic resolution, an annual resolution probably, but how to correlate them? How to say this peak is, belongs to the other one? On the other hand, if you lower the frequency here, with your, if, you're, if you're doing applying averages, then you see that the both curves coincide quite well. They go in the opposite direction of this. So one thing you can again, thresholds, uh, to lower the number, and uh, then you see it, the, the picture becomes a little bit clearer, so there are clusters uh, again, and then you can say, okay, these peaks are, or these events are closer. In this case, we have no doubt about this. This is event, in other words, it's probably a little bit displaced. But anyway, one message is that we get here from this last, let's say, 400 years, uh, only the half of the events, if you are, if you say we, you could correlate this, that it's not absolutely accurate, but it, you can correlate this, that only 50% uh, you can use in, in coincidence. The th next thing is um, that uh, looking on the last 150 years, it, it gave, get more precise, and you see uh, now this is again the damages, uh, these are the uh, flood layers again, and this are uh, the instrumental data, so we put no new series to this to, to calibrate this. Uh, so you get here uh, some uh, maximum discharges, but uh, this is not really the, the strong point here. Again, uh, it seems to be that some events correlate, but others are probably displaced. How to resolve this? Um, yeah, this is the question. And the other thing is that the, the thickest layer, for example, of the, they do not fit with nothing, absolutely nothing. This is probably because the processes are quite different in a very small, high elevation uh, uh, catchment. So this is uh, 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 another dynamic. If you're going down water or downstream, this is the Lake Thun, this is the work of uh, Stephanie Wirth. Again, there are turbidites, and this turbidites uh, uh, correlates quite well. And the, the advantage is that really, if you get large floods in the floodplain, you get the water, in, or this is sediments, into the lake. And of course, then it's, it's probably you can say, yes, we know, if there happened a flood, the flood affected also the lake. So therefore, you can be a little bit sure about the correlation and uh, you are, are more confident. Anyway, what I also want to say is uh, don't forget that also if you plot instrumental data against the damage, uh, flood damage data, you also don't find an accurate or absolutely accurate uh, 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 coincidence. Uh, there are differences, and they are also explainable by the, the several subcatchments. They have different discharges, there are, or the thunderstorm, or there's a vector situation. So this depends really on the discharges that you get, and they don't have to, to produce really a severe damage. And it's only at the of the final remarks, there are only three slides more, very short. But what can we do now with this situation, with the problems, with this uncertainties? So the problem, what we can do probably is, and this is uh, interesting for our uh, future project, is you can plot it in a map where you get the data from uh, the different proxies in, uh, regarding the, 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 the magnitude here, in three scales, let's say it is. This is 1831, and you see all the three catchments were affected. The problems are the lakes. The problems of the lakes is, of course, that you don't know which of this thickness corresponds to which column here of the damage. This is a problem because they are high elevated lakes, and they are not the big flood that do not provide the sediments to there. And this is 1762. There's also something that we have to pay, take into consideration. Now you think, okay, this is empty, there no, nothing occurred there, but this was the largest flood in this catchment. And because the center of the precipitation and the flooding were to the eastern part of the, uh, of the uh, um, uh, Swiss Alps. So therefore, this is some outcome. The other outcome is, uh, I don't go to nothing about this. So this typical correlation uh, with uh, smooth curves you can do. And the other thing is you can define flood periods now. Uh, and then the modelers, uh, Juan Carlos, use this to, um, uh, to, to compare our flat periods to types of, uh, of modes of uh, atmospheric variability as for the summer NAO on the omega uh, configuration. 
And uh, this is uh, probably these three points is uh, that which I say, okay, this type of data we can, uh, um, we can provide and with this data we can work. Thank you very much.